Heaven, we thank Thee, Lord, for Thy blessings, for Thy goodness to us, and for all that Thou hast done. And we thank Thee that we can gather now for this class. I pray that we would all be attentive and interested, not only in what Thy Word says, but also in the fulfillment of it, knowing, O Lord, that what Thy Word says will certainly come to pass. I pray, O God, that Thou wouldst help us to see this from history, that Thou wouldst help us, O Lord, that we would marvel at Thy works and Thy goodness. I pray that Thou wouldst lead us and direct us now in all wisdom and knowledge, that Thy Spirit would guide us, that every unclean spirit would be rebuked and cast out of this place through the power of Thy saving blood. I pray, Lord, that every one of us now would try our best to learn and to remember and to understand all of these things. We just ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, now, first of all, let me just say something. Some of you may be a little concerned about an upcoming test. And uh, you don't have to worry about the test. We are going to have a study guide before we have it. Uh, we're not going to have class next week because it'll be spring break. And uh, that's going to give me a little extra time. I can prepare a study guide for you. The test will uh, not be so much specifics as far as dates are concerned and things like that. What I'm hoping you will get out of this overview of history is a basic picture of everything. So you have a, a basic understanding of what happened, how it works, and I think any of us who are paying attention can figure that out. It should form a picture in your mind as I teach these things to you. Does everyone understand what I'm trying to say? Okay, now if I can have your undivided attention and you can be absolutely quiet, we will proceed. Okay? Now, last time we had talked about the fall of the Roman Empire, and I think it was quite amazing. I hope you think it was amazing. The Word of God was so very specific. We looked at the trumpet judgments and how God was destroying, bringing down, and pulling down the most powerful empire that had ever existed. He did it by what we call divine intervention. The Lord raised up enemies to bring down Rome. But there's a lot of intrigue that continued on. In fact, you look at the world today, it's no pretty sight. It's getting nastier and nastier all the time. And Jesus came and he died for our sins. He came to save our souls and he accomplished that. We have to understand that. But as far as the world is concerned, it has to run its course. And he saves us out of this world system. He didn't come and make everything perfect in this world. He came to make a people perfect that live within the world. And he's perfecting us and working on us every day. I hope you're working with him. Now, when the Roman Empire fell, if you remember, barbaric tribes. Now, barbaric means strange tribes. In fact, uh, the name Barbara, it's a common name for women, for girls, means strange one. So if you know somebody named Barbara... Uh, that name actually means that she is strange. Okay? Barbarous means from a strange place, unfamiliar. Doesn't mean strange, weird. It means unfamiliar. So anyway, barbaric tribes from Europe and the surrounding area came against Rome and brought that empire down. We talked about that last week. But if you remember, the Bible says that when the Roman Empire would fall another sort of empire would rise in its place. Now, the reason I said sort of is because once Jesus came, there never could really be another world empire. And you will note, as we've studied history, we have found that there has always been a one-world government, a primary world empire at all times up until Jesus came. The empire that was in existence at the time Jesus came was Rome, remember? It was Caesar Augustus that sent out the decree that all the world should be taxed. Since that time, there has never been a one-world government. Until Jesus came, there was always one. Since he came, there was never one. That should tell us something, right? Okay, so there will never be another one. And they're sort of... When I say sort of is one, it's not complete and never can be. We have an almost world empire, 
right now. And there have been numerous attempts throughout history for all the king's horses and all the king's men to put the broken egg together again, meaning when Rome fell. By the way, what was the primary symbol of Babylon? An egg on a pedestal with a snake wrapped around it with a crescent moon on the top. Starting next week, by the way, I'll be using an overhead projector and I'll be showing you some of these actual pictures and symbols that were used. But uh, you'll notice that nursery rhyme, Humpty Dumpty sat on a wall, Humpty Dumpty had a great fall. All the king's horses and all the king's men couldn't put Humpty Dumpty together again. It's a cute little nursery rhyme about an egg that falls off the wall and nobody, no force, nothing could put the egg back together again. So what that nursery rhyme indicated, and this is from antiquity, this goes way back to the Middle Ages like a lot of nursery rhymes do. This Mother Goose stuff goes way back there. And they're very political. Anyway, what it means is when Rome fell, nobody could put Rome together again. Try as they would and try as they might, it could not be accomplished. Okay? Now, even though Rome fell, another kind of empire came into being. In fact, the rise of a new kind of an empire, as I have at the top of the board here. Now, is this foretold in the Scripture? If we look at Daniel 7 for a moment, Daniel chapter 7, verse 19... All right, let's listen to what it says. And we're going to read here from Daniel 7, 19, right through verse 21. Then I would know the truth of the fourth beast, which was diverse from all the others. Now, what was that? That was Rome, wasn't it? Okay? Exceeding dreadful, whose teeth were of iron and his nails of brass, which devoured, break in pieces, and stamped the residue with his feet. We have a picture there, the fourth beast, which we know to be Rome. And of the ten horns that were in his head, and of the other which came up, and before whom three fell. Even of that horn that had eyes and a mouth that spake very great things, whose look was more stout than his fellows. I beheld, and the same horn made war with the saints and prevailed against them. All right. I'll read one more verse. Until the Ancient of Days came, and judgment was given to the saints of the Most High, and the time came that the saints possessed the kingdom. So this is a very quick uh, glance at all of history right up until the time Jesus comes, talking about the Ancient of Days sitting in judgment. That's at the end of the world. But you will note here that when this dreadful beast, diverse from all the others, when it fell, a little horn came up in its place. A little horn. Something very different. It had eyes, and it had a mouth, and it spoke very great things. Now, if the beast represented a political empire with armies and navies that could go out and conquer, what would be the little horn that's diverse, that's different, whose look was more stout than his fellows? What could that possibly be? Let's look at another. I'll answer the question very soon. But uh, let's look at another place here, Daniel 2.36. If you want to back up just a little bit. Daniel 2, in verse 36. This is the dream. Now, I'm going to have to read down to about 45 for us to get the gist of all of this. This is the dream, and we will tell the interpretation thereof before the king. Thou, O king, art a king of kings. Let me give you some background before I read this. Uh, You may or may not be familiar with this story. Oh, just before I do that, would you just shut the tape off for a moment? Okay, I think we've got our little technical problem ironed out here now, so we'll continue on. Uh, I'm going to read from Daniel 2, 
starting at the 36th verse, and I had mentioned I was going to give you a little background on what's happening here. Nebuchadnezzar had a dream, and in the dream he dreamed about a big statue made out of different kinds of metal. He didn't know what it meant, and of course Daniel was gifted by God, unlike his other advisors. Daniel's gift was from God, not the devil. Uh, Daniel was able to interpret this dream, and he's about to do that right now in this verse, or in these following verses. This is the dream, and we will tell the interpretation thereof before the king. Thou, O king, art a king of kings. He's talking to the king of Babylon, of course. For the God of heaven hath given thee a kingdom, power, and strength, and glory. And wheresoever the children of men dwell, the beasts of the field, and the fowls of heaven hath he given into thine hand, and hath made thee ruler over them all. Thou art this head of gold. So the statue that he sees is a it's a huge one. It's out in the he built one in fact after the dream, put it out in the plain of Dura. And uh, the measurements are given later in this book, just following this actually. But anyway, here Daniel's saying, Nebuchadnezzar, you are the gold head on this big statue. And after thee shall arise another kingdom inferior to thee and another third kingdom of of brass, which shall bear rule over all the earth. The second kingdom was silver. And what was that? Medo-Persia. Now, he says, a third kingdom would be brass, and that was Greece. Everyone is an inferior metal, one to the other. From the top down, the metal becomes of lower value, inferior. And the fourth kingdom shall be strong as iron, For as much as iron breaketh in pieces and subdueth all things, and as iron that breaketh all these, shall it break in pieces and bruise. (coughs) Excuse me. So, the fourth kingdom, of course, is Rome. Now watch what happens. Because remember I said after the Roman Empire fell, there was no more world empire. And whereas thou sawest the feet and toes, part of potter's clay and part of iron, the kingdom shall be divided, but there shall be in it the strength of the iron, forasmuch as thou sawest the iron mixed with miry clay. So what he's seeing here is the base of the statue, the feet, the toes, are part iron and clay. It's mixed. Now what do we know about iron and clay? It doesn't mix. You can form it together, but it doesn't adhere. It doesn't stick. It isn't one thing. It never could be. And as the toes of the feet were part of iron and part of clay, so the kingdom shall be partly strong and partly broken. And whereas thou sawest iron mixed with miry clay, they shall mingle themselves with the seed of men, but they shall not cleave one to another, even as iron is not mixed with clay." So what's God saying here? Even though there was a solid gold empire, one metal, that fell. There was one of silver, that fell. There was one of brass, that fell. There was one of iron, that was Rome, that fell. All that's left of the statue after the Roman Empire fell were the feet and the toes, and they're part iron and part clay, so it's not a true solid empire. Does everyone understand that? It just looks like it. They look like feet, they look like toes on the statue, but it's just a mixture that has no strength in it. The strength of iron is in it, but it doesn't hold with a clay, so it can't hold together in a true solid form. You follow that? Thus we have governments today, and have had all through history since the fall of the Roman Empire, that tried to rule the world and failed. We've had systems that rose up as great strength, uh, 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 towers of great strength, I should say, but they could not ever rule the world. <clears throat> Never have. So there we see it in two places in Daniel. Now let's look at Second Thessalonians, and in a minute I'll tell you what the little horn is. Second Thessalonians 2, we're going to the New Testament now. All right, 
second. I hope someone will copy down all those notes for me because I didn't copy those off paper. I just wrote those out out of my head. So um, if somebody will copy that down for me, I can use that for a study guide. Because I don't know that I write it out exactly like this in that order again. It'd be close, but it wouldn't be exact. Okay. 2 Thessalonians 2, 1 through 12. Listen carefully. Now we beseech you, brethren, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and by our gathering together unto him, that ye be not soon shaken in mind or be troubled neither by spirit nor by word nor by letter as from us. Notice, not a letter from him, but a fake one, as from us. As that the day of Christ is at hand. Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come. Meaning what? The day of the Lord's coming will not arrive. It will not come, except there come a falling away first, so there'll be a false church will rise up. And that man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition. Notice. Now, the word perdition means eternal damnation. There will have to be a falling away of the Christian church. A phony one will arise. And a man in charge of that phony church will take over, right? Right? a man of eternal damnation, perdition, who opposeth and exalteth himself above all that is called God or that is worshipped, so that he as God, notice he's not God, but he's trying to be, sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. He's saying very blatantly, very brazenly and boldly, I am God. There is such a man. And that is the Pope of Rome. He claims to be Christ on earth. And don't let any Catholics tell you he doesn't, because he does. It's right in their, uh, in their writings. And if you want to know where, it, you could look in the, uh, at any of the, the councils, whether he's declared as such. Council of Trent uh, is one for an example. But uh, also the dictates of Hildebrand clearly state that the Pope is God. Pope Gregory Hildebrand uh, listed a whole bunch of things showing that, well, one, for example, is that the Pope is crowned with a triple crown, King of Heaven, King of Earth, King of Purgatory. Everyone has to bow before him. Okay, that he is another God on earth. That's what they actually state, and we have the writings to prove it. So don't let these Catholic people tell you that he doesn't claim he's God. He certainly does. Now, notice, it goes on and says, Remember ye not that when I was yet with you, I told you these things? And now, watch this, ye know what withholdeth that he might be revealed in his time. For the mystery of iniquity doth already work. In other words, the thing that's going to make this all happen is already set in motion. Only he who now letteth will let until he be taken out of the way. Who has to be taken out of the way before this new son of perdition can come along? Caesar. When Caesar is taken out of the way, a new kind of a Caesar will rise up. Remember, Caesar called himself Pontifex Maximus. What does the Pope call himself? Pontifex Maximus, the chief pontiff. And then shall that wicked be revealed, whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth and shall destroy with the brightness of his coming. Even him, whose coming is after the working of Satan with all power and signs and lying wonders. So it's going to get real intense. And uh, I'll tell you, with all of the space technology going on, there can be a lot of signs and wonders that are manufactured. And with all deceivableness of unrighteousness in them that perish. Now here's why people perish. Because they receive not the love of the truth that they might be saved. And for this cause, see you can receive the truth, but if you don't receive the love of it, you won't retain it. You'll give it up. It won't be important to you. And for this cause shall God send them strong delusion that they should believe a lie. There is only one thing that keeps us from believing a lie, and that's God. But if God sends them strong delusion, then they'd have no remedy. 
That's why it's imperative that we love the truth. That they all might be damned who believed not the truth but had pleasure in unrighteousness. So what does this tell us? We read two places in Daniel that there would be a fall of an empire and the rise of another, a different kind of one. Not political necessarily, but ecclesiastical. Does anybody here know what ecclesiastical means? Ecclesiastical. It means religious, doesn't it? A religious power. And then in 2 Thessalonians, we read about something being taken out of the way in order for that man of sin to be revealed, that son of perdition, who claims to be Christ. Okay. Now, let's look at some of the history of this. We read from Scripture what would happen. Now, let's see what did happen. In, and you'll find that it matches very well. I'm certain that you won't be surprised at that. Not by now. We said in 325 A.D. that there was a man named Constantine. Constantine, if you recall, took over the entire Roman Empire in 323. He moved the capital from Rome to Byzantium and changed the name of the city Byzantium to Constantinople. And that, of course, is on the Hellespont and the Bosporus area, which is now Istanbul in Turkey, right? In other words, uh, if you look at the country of Turkey and you look at the Black Sea, it's that tiny little doorway from the Black Sea out into the, eventually into the Mediterranean Sea. Okay? That is where Constantinople was. Now it is Istanbul. Okay? So, in 325 A.D., Constantine held a council at the city of Nicaea, and in Nicaea he basically became the head of a church empire, a different kind of emperor, a new kind of emperor, empire. Not just geographical, but over men's souls. Now Caesar was actually, well, he didn't call himself Caesar particularly, but now he was heading up not just the state, but the church. You could call him the first pope, I suppose. De facto. They didn't use the word pope yet. Does anybody know what the word pope means? I hope you children will put your thinking caps on and think these things through. Pope comes from the word papas, papas. You get the word papa from that. It means father. And if they call him Holy Father, they're in violation of a scripture, aren't they? And that is exactly what the Catholic people call him, Holy Father. A man wearing a crown on earth called Holy Father. So, Constantine headed up a new kind of empire, a church empire. Now, all the major cities of the world at that time, whether it was Alexandria, Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamos, Thyatira, Rhodes, Athens, Sparta, uh, Caesarea, and uh, all the different, all the main cities had a bishop over them, ruling over that city. You got to remember, Paul predicted it too, the church would fall away. Christianity would not remain pure. Grievous wolves would come in, not sparing the flock. And they were manufacturing a new kind of religion. All the backslidden people began to take on the traditions, the holidays, all the things going on round about them, and bring it in and try to make it and fit into Christianity. A lot of idolatry, heathen customs, heathen celebrations, and they mixed this all together. Now, a number of things are going on here. All these major cities have bishops over this backslidden church. And the bishop at Rome eventually gained power and recognition over and above all other bishops. And Rome became the center of the church probably because of its prior power status. And uh, the church at Rome, the bishop at Rome, then became the head of the church, became known as the Pope. 
became known as the papacy. All of the hills, the seven hills that Rome was built upon were renamed and given Christian sounding names. But you could trace it if you really wanted to. For an example, uh, the uh, Oh, all these Roman hills had temples on them too, heathen temples. For an example, the hill for Mars, the god of war, they had a temple built on there dedicated to Mars, which is really a devil, god of war. They kept the same temple, left the same statues in it, and they named it Saint, the Temple of St. Martin. All right? That was just one little example. So they just renamed them, and, you know, St. Martin sounds a whole lot like Mars. And the people really didn't mind because they had the same idols in it, and they kept the same holidays, and everything was just intact. It's just now it's Christian. Now we can call it Christian. Now we can attribute all the things that, you know, about Jesus that they wanted to believe could be brought in and kind of mixed together, and everybody would be happy. All the backslidden Christians would like it, all the heathen would become back would become something less than a Christian, sort of. See what's happening here? And it would get bigger and bigger and bigger. Now, a little sidelight here. Way back, because this is all happening in the 300s A.D., isn't it? But something happened in 70 A.D. Something very, very important. Who knows what that was? 70 A.D., Something took place. Shall we? Jerusalem fell. A Roman general named Cestius surrounded the city of Jerusalem. Cestius stayed there, laid siege to the city for about a week, and then mysteriously left for no reason. Nobody knows why. But remember how Jesus told his people, and it's in our Bible, when ye see Jerusalem compassed about with armies, what did he say to do? To flee. Come down, don't even go up to the housetop to take anything. Get out of there. Get out fast. And go to the hills of Judea. And so what actually took place is, God had removed Cestius, Cestius came in, surrounded the city, but he left. That allowed every Christian to get out of Jerusalem. It's estimated there were about 60,000 of them that left the city of Jerusalem. They went into the hills where there was a man named Herod Agrippa who took care of the Christians and fed them in the hills of Judea, which was his domain. He's the same Herod Agrippa that heard the words of Paul say to him, Thou believest, I know that thou believest. And Herod said, Almost thou persuadest me to be a Christian. It looks from history like he actually did become one. Which would have been the last wonderful thing that Paul ever did for his people, is to put something in the heart of that man who then took care of all of those people. He was a king, but he was a dissident king. And uh, when... Cestius then left. It was not long until Titus came, besieged the city, and they completely ripped it apart, tore it down, burnt it up. Not one stone was left upon another in the great temple. People were killed. It was, it was the most horrible thing anybody had ever seen to that day. In fact, there was blood. The way Josephus, the historian, described it, the brother of Nicodemus was a man named Josephus who wrote a big history book. I have a copy of that. And the way he described Jerusalem as it was coming down, he said there was blood and fire and pillars of smoke. You can read in your Bible where there would be blood and fire and pillars of smoke or vapors of smoke. It's in Acts chapter 2. It's also in the book of Joel. So you have an actual fulfillment there. Okay, question? All right. The whole city was destroyed. There was absolutely nothing left other than a few rocks laying around. They did try to rebuild it. In fact, now they have something called the Wailing Wall, but only five or six stones are really from the western wall of the temple. The rest are all just fake. And they put it all up saying this is the whole western wall. 
There was just a whole lot of lying going on because it was used in order to capture the religious theistic spirits of people in an error and to hold them into a false religion. That's why they did all of this stuff. Tried to rebuild all that sort of thing. But no, it did come completely down, as Jesus said, not one stone would be left upon another, and there wasn't. In fact, they, we know that the Roman soldiers were paid by what they could plunder. They didn't get a check from the government. They took what they could, and that was their pay. And there was a lot of gold in that temple. When they put the torch to it and those cedar beams began to burn, the gold melted and ran down through the crevices of the rocks. So you had all these soldiers out there with crowbars prying the rocks apart to get the gold out. And that's why there wasn't one stone left on another, because they were going to get everything they could out of there. Okay? So it fulfilled the very words of Jesus. So anyway, in 70 A.D., what happened to the Pharisees? We hear about them in the Bible. Now Jerusalem fell. Where were the Pharisees? They weren't dumb. They, they, in fact, they referred to themselves as the learned elders of Zion. Jesus said they were serpents. They were a generation of vipers. They left. They relocated. They moved on. They escaped. And they relocated in a place called Alexandria, Egypt, the second most important city of its day. Alexandria, Egypt became the home of the Pharisees. The 70 men on the Sanhedrin court actually relocated at Alexandria. And they formed a school that they referred, them, they referred to it as the University of the Gnostics, or the wise ones, the learned elders of Zion. Okay, Gnostic means wise one, and it has the very same meaning as witch. Witch comes from the word wicca. Wicca means wise ones. Gnostics, Gnostic means wise one. One who knows, just as agnostic or agnostic, put an A in front of Gnostic, which starts with a G, you pronounce the hard G, agnostic, then that means one who doesn't know. An agnostic is different from an atheist in that an atheist says, I don't believe in God. An agnostic says, I don't know. A gnostic says, I know everything. So that's what they refer to themselves as, the gnostics. Now, that was just a little sidelight because I, what I had done is digressed back to 70 AD there. Now, Eusebius, remember I said every city had a bishop? There was a man from Caesarea by the name of Eusebius, and he became the bishop of Rome. Now, when he was the bishop of Rome, and uh, we're going to jump ahead here a little bit because that was in about 330 A.D., under the reign of Constantine. Eusebius ordered the Gnostics to write a new Christian Bible. They were the wisest men, after all, since they were the, the wisest men and had this university thing going there where they were teaching others. Of course, by now the original Pharisees were long dead, but their descendants and others they had trained had taken over in all of their old ways. These elders, learned elders of Zion, they were the ones, in other words, unbelievers, those who rejected Jesus Christ, came up with this new Bible. Now, the original Bible was written in Greek. It was written in a common form of Greek called Koine Greek. And Koine Greek was something that was spoken out on the street and all the common people understood it. There was another kind of Greek called Classical Greek. And, of course, that was for the upper crust. That was for the big wheels. They all spoke Classical Greek. Lo and behold, when uh, the school of the Gnostics came out with this new Bible, it was in classical Greek. And the true Christians that were interspersed out there and everywhere didn't have much status. They were looked down upon because they were true to the Lord. They recognized the error right away. They said, this isn't God's word. Okay? They put it together. And what did they translate it from? 
They didn't just write it from nothing. They translated it from something. Well, they used the Septuagint for one thing. Okay? They used a, a, uh, an altered form. They actually produced the Septuagint prior to this. The learned elders of Zion are the ones that put that together too. But this was not taken from the original manuscripts which were from Antioch. They were kept at Antioch. As a matter of fact, the Bible says they were first called Christians at Antioch. These Gnostics rejected the writings, the original writings from Antioch, which were written by the apostles, and they put together their own. Okay? Forged writings that began to appear. In fact, there were a whole bunch of different... uh, They even had a Gospel of Thomas, and they had uh, all these other things that people just wrote, and they accepted all this stuff. Another question? Yes, the entire Bible and the Apocrypha. They were adding other things in the Apocrypha. Not really. They had a, they had a real good reason for doing this. You see, they weren't concerned about serving God. They were concerned about building a vast empire religiously. And they knew that in order to get people to follow them, see, most people hated their government. Most people today don't have a whole lot of use for their government. Their government takes their money, makes them buy licenses, puts restrictions on them, so they don't like the government. The government is popular. It doesn't mean it's liked. The word popular doesn't mean you like something. It means it's accepted because of enforcement. Because if you don't go along with it, they'll take your property, they'll put you in jail, see? So people don't like their government. So the way to rule people is not with the iron fist of political control. The absolute way to rule people is to get them to believe that you have the power to determine where they will spend eternity. Okay? That you can put them in heaven or you can put them in hell. That's why a true leader, I mean, somebody who really has that, I'm not saying true leader, true to God, but he has that ambition of a leader. He will want that kind of power. He'll want people to believe that he can control their eternal destiny okay that's why the pope has so much power and always has and as long as any king had that power if you could get people to believe that there isn't anything they wouldn't do for you and see that was the condition here all they wanted to do was build an empire to control the souls of men absolute allegiance and of course it's the devil who ultimately wants that That's why at the very end of the world you have the same sort of thing going on. Everybody religiously trapped, ensnared. Okay, anyway, so a Bible was produced. And as a result of that, I believe 50 copies were made initially by the Gnostics at Alexandria. Now, the head of the Gnostics at Alexandria at that time was a man named Origen. Not Origen as the beginning of something. It's spelled differently. O-R-I-G-E-N. Origen was the head of the school of the Gnostics, and he contacted Eusebius, and he said, Eusebius, not only did I produce a Bible for you, I'm going to make a new religion. Because you've got a problem here. You've got all of these people out there that are rich, that are influential, and they'll never become Christians because there are so many poor people, you know, in the Christian church, and the, the ones who claim to be really Christians teach that all men are equal, no matter what their standing is, what their uh, exchequer looks like, what their status is. And isn't that the way it ought to be? That if a rich man came in, he'd have to bow the knee just like anybody else. And his riches would mean nothing. His title would mean nothing. His social status would mean nothing. You follow that? Well, that doesn't appeal to... If you're going to talk to some rich guy, some millionaire in town, and say, now, you need to serve the Lord, but in order to do so, if you come to the church that uh, I want to bring you to, you're going to be a big nothing. 
Okay? If you talk to the mayor of a city and say that this isn't going to make any difference, you won't get any recognition for being a mayor if you come to church. You'll be just like anybody else. That doesn't appeal to them. You see, Eusebius realized he had a problem of getting rich, influential, wealthy, high-status people into the church. So Origen said, I'll fix it. I'll make a new church. He said, I will blend together. I will mix together all of the symbolism of Egypt. These were his exact words. You don't find these in too many history books, do you? He said, I will blend together the symbolism of Egypt, the rituals of the Old Testament, the wisdom of the Greeks, and the terminology of the Christians. And I will produce a church that will appeal to those who are rich and powerful. As a result, he came forth with something called the Roman Catholic Church, which to this day has the symbols of Egypt. You can see them right in their windows and in their literature. Has the wisdom of the Greeks, that old Gnostic wisdom, has the rituals of the Old Testament, the, the special days, the separate priesthood, the holy temple, the sacred buildings and sacred days and all that stuff. But the terminology, the sound of Christianity, but that's all it is. So that then was the brainchild of Origen. Now about 440 AD, a man named Leo became Pope. He, became, he was the first one to be recognized as Pope, Pope Leo. Of course, the Catholic Church claims that Peter was the first Pope. Problem there, he was never in Rome. Problem there, he had a wife because he had a mother-in-law. So says the scripture. Okay? But Leo the first becomes the first Pope. Now, that was about 440 A.D., and when you get up to about 500 A.D., you have what's called the Dark Ages coming in. They begin. And during this time, there were a lot of power struggles. Now, this is an overview. I'm not going to get real detailed here. It'd take forever. But uh, there was a lot of feudalism. Who knows what feudalism is? It's kind of like brothers and sisters fighting, but on a larger scale, right? Feudalism. Does everybody understand what it is? I mean, you've got all these villages and towns and, and little hamlets and so forth built up and one can't trust the other and the other can't trust the other and the other can't trust this one or that one or any of them. So everybody's got to build up their own little defense because one of them might get the notion, hey, I want what they've got and just go over and take it from them. There was no big police power, no big protective army to maintain law and order. It was like street gangs, okay? Just law of the claw, take what you can get. Law of the jungle, I should say. Survival of the fittest. And so every village, every little town or hamlet or whatever the case may be, they pick their biggest, strongest guy with the biggest pectoral muscles and biggest tri biceps, triceps, quadriceps, and hamstrings and all the other anatomy. They pick the biggest guy they could find, put a tin suit on him, set him on a horse, Give him a lance and a sword, and he would be their knight. He was their armor division. Okay? And they'd go around and marauding and fighting, and once in a while there'd be a, a unity of several. And, but, but it was basically a lot of fragmented feuding and fighting and fussing around. Okay? That went on for quite a while. We call that the Dark Ages. The sun kept coming up, just like it always did, but it was dark ages because it was such a time of fear. And fear is like, like a spiritual darkness. You have to understand that. Perfect love casteth out all fear, and that love is the light of God. Take that away and you've got darkness. Okay? The Bible uses that. In fact, it talks about darkness being upon every face during a time of fear and sorrow. Okay, now, 
after a while of this uh, feuding and fighting and so forth, one particular people became very strong, the Frankish power. Now, these people lived on the border of what is now France, and Clovis came into power about 486. And uh, he, what he did is he unified a lot of these little branches of... Uh, he took a whole bunch of these little feudal cities and said, Look, we're not getting anywhere. Why don't we unify and, and throw our knights together and just get everything together and we can really make a dent in this thing and we can set up a nation. And he was uh, quite a character because 10 years after he came into power, he married a very strict Roman Catholic woman and uh, a very influential one. And he actually uh, did a lot to unify. In fact, it was, I believe it was, uh, I don't know the exact year, but it was, I think, well, yeah, it was 10 years after, before 96, when he, uh, he actually stood up and proclaimed that he was now the head of, the, the political head of Christianity, serving under the Pope. Okay? Anyway, uh, he came and went. It was years later, and I told you about this uh, man one other time, Charles Martel. Remember him? In 732, he gained control. Remember how the Muslims had risen up and they were trying to get into Europe? And it was Charles, the head of the Franks at that time, that stopped the Muslims at Tours in France. Because he stopped them there, the Pope gave him a title. Instead of just Charles, he was now Charles Martel. Martel means the hammer. Charles the hammer, Martel. Okay? Then in 741, his son, Pepin, took control. So Charles Martel, remember I said, was the grandfather of Charlemagne. In 741, Pepin took control, and he kept things going. The empire, or I shouldn't say empire, the nation got stronger and stronger, the nation of the Franks. And the Frankish Empire then, in 768, came under the control of another man named Charles. And Charles here, in 800 A.D., went to Rome, was invited to Rome by the Pope at that time. And the Pope, in a surprise, this was unexpected, put a crown upon Charles's head and gave him a new title. He was called Charlemagne. Now look at that. It looks like Charles Magni, doesn't it? Charlemagne. That's the French pronunciation, Charlemagne. They don't say the G there, okay? Looks like Charlemagne. What it means is Charles the Great. Charlemagne means Charles. Magna means great, doesn't it? Charles the Great. Okay. And the Pope crowned him. He gave him a special name. He called him Charles Augustus, Emperor of the Romans. And he declared that he was the head of the Holy Roman Empire. He was the Pope's king, the Pope's man, political puppet, to rule all of Europe and the known world. The Pope said, I am reviving the Roman Empire. I will be its god, and Charlemagne will be its king. And Charlemagne went out to unify all the little barbaric tribes and everything and try to put the Roman Empire back together again, and he absolutely failed. Okay? And matter of fact, by the early 900s, the HRE, Holy Roman Empire as it was called, crumbled. In fact, it was Voltaire who said it isn't holy, it isn't Roman, and it's not really an empire. <laughs> the whole thing is just a big phony baloney. Any comments or questions so far? No comments or questions. Am I covering all of this well enough? Maybe I'm... Not leaving room for any questions here. Okay, well, let's continue on. 
after uh, the Holy Roman Empire, as it was called, crumbled, we went back to feudal, more feudalism again. See, that kind of was put on hold for a while when Charlemagne was out there dashing around saying, I am it, because the Pope put the crown on my head. And everybody was cheering. Oh, if the Pope did it, the Pope is God, so we got to listen to this guy. And they all did obeyance to him. They all uh, bowed the knee in deference to him. So, when that empire crumbled, you went back to the feudalism, the castles, knights, in the days of old when knights were bold and so forth. You know, and the chivalry started to come forth. And uh, it, Europe then, at, during this time, when more and more knights and, and people were vying for power, during this time they had some real problems on their hands. Europe went into a state of turmoil. They were attacked by a marauding, powerful, nasty group of people called the Vikings. The Vikings came from the North Country. They were called Norsemen. They spoke a language called Old Norse. Well, it's called Norse. We call it Old Norse because it's old. Um, they were the ancestors of the Norwegians, somewhat maybe of the Swedish, but mostly Norwegian. Uh, they had some Danish in them, but they were from the North Country. And they would uh, be known for their long boats with a kind of a dragon shape to them with all the shields attached to the sides and all the oars sticking out. And they were a fierce and relentless group of people. They wore iron helmets with horns sticking out of them. They believed to die in combat was the highest honor and would send them directly to Odin, their god. They had a three-person godhead called Odin, Thor, and Frey. And from the Frey, you get Friday. That's where the name... That was his day. Frey's day. Friday. Okay? And they were uh, a fierce group of people. They would go in and steal everything they could. In fact, they were so bold, they would go right up the rivers well into Europe and do a lot of marauding. Okay. So you had the Vikings that were giving them a lot of trouble. There was another group called the Ma Magyars. The Magyars were the ancestors of the Huns, the Hungarian people. But they were similar to the Vikings. These were all a nasty bunch. And they'd come in and, and cause all kinds of grief. Then you had some Moslems called the Moors. M-O-O-R-S, the Moors. They came up from northern Africa. So Europe had its hands full. And they were finding the need then to unify even more, to fight off these nasty Vikings, Magyars, and Moors, and other such people. Well, after this was going on, all this war, you have to understand, hundreds of years of this. Finally, a little island off from Europe, really part of Europe, started to uh, develop, you could say. And uh, in 886 A.D., the Danes, who had controlled this for a while, lost power and it ended up in the hands of a people called the Saxons. Now Saxony was actually over between Denmark and Germany, northern Germany, the Saxons. But they found their way into England and of course the ancient peoples of England were, were remember the Picts, the Utes, and the, and the Brethens? But uh, the Saxons began to gain control and then, of course, you had William the Conqueror coming in later, and you had the Angles and Saxons mixing together, and from that you got England. Okay? But it began to gain power. Of course, if you go way back to uh, the days of King Arthur, Ex the story of Excalibur, Arthur Pendragon, and Merlin the Magician, and all that, during those ages, uh, the Knights of the Round Table... That's all from way back in that era during that feudalistic time. But as England began to develop and gain in strength, 
eventually, I know I'm, uh, as I said, this is an overview. I can't get extremely detailed. If you think I'm leaving something real important out that you know about, then let me know and we'll cover that. But I think these are the high points we should hit. After England began to develop, the Pope in 10, 1095, Pope Urban II, became very, very distressed about something. What got him so upset is that the Muslims had taken the Holy Land. Now, we're not worried about a Holy Land because our Holy Land is in heaven. But to the Catholic Church, they believed that Jerusalem was the Holy Land. The Muslims had taken it. And there was a man named Saladin. Saladin, the head of the Muslims that had taken this land. And later on, they, of course, they had built, the, a man named Omar built a big mosque on where the temple site was, on uh, Moriah. And so anyway, the mound or hill of Moriah. So anyway, uh, what happened is the Pope said, we've got to go in and take that land back and get Jerusalem out of the hand of these Muslims. Now these Muslims were real fierce because up in the hill country there was a man who called himself the old man of the mountain. The old man of the mountain would train the Muslim soldiers. Here's what he'd do. He would uh, get all these Muslim soldiers together. He would get them high on hash, hashish. Okay? And as a matter of fact, the word assassin comes from the word uh, I'm trying to think of how they did that comes from hashish assassin comes from that what he'd do he'd get them all high and euphoric and he'd bring them into a place where they would be banqueting and women all over the place and they'd th he would tell them they had that, that this was heaven after they had their big party all these soldiers would go out and they were then told when they would come around, they would, they remembered this, but they, it was so it was kind of foggy, you know. So they were told you had a taste of heaven, and if you die in battle, you'll go and stay there forever. He gave them, the, in other words, he gave them the party of their life, and then said, if you go out and die in battle, you can go back there forever. It was a big lie, but boy, were they anxious to fight. So you had these Muslims dedicated, willing to give their lives not for a cause, but for hedonism. And the Pope was saying, we've got to take this land away from these Muslims. This is the Holy Land. So, he called for all the people... In, now, bear in mind, nations in Europe had begun to develop. England had come to the forefront but he was calling for crusaders to go on a crusade to take this land back. The first crusade then began in 1095 as all these knights mounted up their horses and of course there, some of them traveled by boat and they, they had all different ways that they went but they went to the Holy Land as it was called and to the city of Jerusalem to fight with these Muslims. So you had Austrians there. You had Franks or Frenchmen there. You had uh, Germanic people there. You had a lot of English knights there. Now the Muslims were called Saracens. They were sword fighters. That's what the word Saracen means. They didn't wear much armor. They had iron breastplates, but they didn't have full suits of armor like many of these other knights had. And all they fought with was a sword, whereas these others had all kinds of sophisticated weapons of their day. They had the mace, which was like a big ball with spikes sticking out of it. Uh, they had shields that were proven to withstand great blows. They used lances where they could pierce a man at a distance. Uh, they had crossbows and longbows. They had all kinds of weapons. And so they went out against these. Their weapons made them very superior as far as their power. 
but the Muslims were superior in number. In fact, uh, a lot of these nights, just for amusement, before breakfast, they'd just go out and ride out into the desert and kill off uh, 40, 50, 60 of these Muslims and go back and have breakfast and go back out and do it again. It was just fun for them, you know. Because these Muslims would, uh, Saracens would just swing their swords and hit their armor and bounce off. And uh, they couldn't stop them. The Crusaders were few in number comparatively, but uh, they would just be out there hacking and slicing away at these Muslims who didn't care because they thought they were going back to their big party. But one day Saladin got smart and he tricked them. What he did is a number of these knights, a lot of these knights went out and they were going to have a real hacking session and to kill a whole bunch of Saracens. The Saracens kept withdrawing little by little back into the desert, back into the desert, back into the desert. Pretty soon these knights got out so far into the desert and they were in their tin suits. <laughs> they were out there in the hot sun and they basically cooked in their tin cans until they couldn't take it anymore. They fell off their horses and they were killed. See, you couldn't get on a horse by yourself if you were a knight. You had to have a squire to help you get on the saddle because that tin suit was heavy. They weighed generally 200 pounds the whole complete suit of armor. So, you know, if you were a 180-pound man, 190, even 220, if you had to wear a 200-pound suit and then try to swing yourself up on the saddle, you had some trouble. Okay? So, they uh, had all kinds of things going on there. Well, the crusade failed. So, uh, there was a second crusade in 1147. That failed. There was a third crusade in 1189. That failed. Toward the end, the only one who stayed there, everybody else went back home and said, forget it. The only one who stayed to fight was a man named Richard, King of England. Now, when I say he alone, I meant his army, too. And in fact, Saladin, the head of the Muslims, saw him one day. And he said, such a man with such a such bravery has the heart of a lion. He became known as Richard Cor de Leon, which means Richard the Lion Hearted. He by himself, on behalf of the Pope, continued the crusade. Meanwhile, his brother, John, Prince John of England, took stole his throne. Just basically said, I, I'm the king, you know, he'll never come back, so uh, I'm just taking over. Well, eventually, when uh, what, what happened actually with the Crusades is a truce was drawn. Richard the Lionhearted had a concession from Saladin. Saladin said, look, we're not giving up the land. And three attempts you made on us have not driven us out. What we will do is we'll allow your people to come and go as they please to make holy pilgrimages and all this stuff. And we'll maintain all of your sacred places intact but we're not giving up the land. And so the truce was made. They said, that's fine with us. And that's how the Crusades ended. The Pope didn't like it, but they had to settle for what they could get. Any questions now? Okay. Yeah, the Children's Crusade actually was, uh, that was an attempt, and these were very young children, that were gathered, there were all these zealots that thought, well, what we need to do is uh, try again. And nobody would go, but they had a whole bunch of children that they had thousands and thousands of children they'd gathered together. And a lot of them just perished in the sea because they loaded them on boats to send them off again to fight the Muslims, you know. It was a real tragic thing. A lot of them died. In fact, you've heard the story of the Pied Piper of Hamelin? The Pied Piper of Hamelin is a, 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 it's a legend, actually. And what it is, it was written to describe that children's crusade. There's quite a story around that. That the Pied Piper is the one who gathered all the children together and took them into oblivion. Okay. Now, we said that John actually gained control of the throne later on, but... He had some real disappointment. Prince John, who became King John of England, had a real problem. 
a lot of people were calling for uh, the power of the king to be limited. And so in 1215, a charter was signed giving parliamentary control to a number of lords and, and also a number of uh, common people. They had House of Lords and House of Commons, which developed from this. But they had a parliamentary form of government, and the king's power was greatly compromised. The Magna Carta, Magna means great, Carta, Charter. It's Latin, Magna Carta, Great Charter. It was signed by King John in 12... 15. Now you can remember that date because 1215 is right after lunch. So when did he sign it? Right after lunch. Okay. Now, in, uh, as time went on, a lot of things happened, but as time went on, something began to happen in the religious world. How are we doing for time? Well, we got 12 minutes yet. Okay. Something began to happen in the religious world. Remember, there was one church in control, the Catholic system. If you weren't Catholic, you had to hide out somewhere. If you were a true Christian, uh, you had to watch it because they persecuted you. And uh, the Catholic system killed, by the way, uh, during a course of all these dark ages and medieval times, it's documented that the Roman Catholic Church murdered 60 million people. You hear so much about 6 million Jews being killed by, by the Germans, which is a greatly inflated number anyway, tragic as it was. How about the 60 million people killed by the Catholic Church that you never hear about? Why isn't that rehearsed over and over in the ears of the people in the history books? It isn't. Okay, but uh, it's covered up. Anyway, as time went on, something called a Reformation began to develop. A young Augustinian priest from a little German town called Eisleben, a man by the name of Luther, Martin Luther, was walking down the road one day when a thunderstorm came up, and it was such a fierce storm he became exceedingly afraid. Great fear set in. And so, crouching down on the road, falling to his knees, he prayed to... Well, I shouldn't say he wasn't an Augustinian yet, excuse me, I'm getting ahead of myself. He was just a young man. He was studying to be an attorney at the behest of his father. Very, very much a Catholic. But he fell to his knees and he promised, he prayed to St. Anne, that if St. Anne would protect him from being killed by this lightning, that he would become a monk and a priest. And he did that. He went into the Augustinian order. He punished himself as the way of the monks was. He would often aff afflict himself. He went to Rome one day, figuring it would be a city of God. And he saw all the drunken priests, and he saw the Pope watching a nude dance and all this kind of stuff. He ended up saying, and he was going there with a, you know, his heart thinking, this is the great, this is going to be like heaven. He said, as a result, if there is a hell, Rome is built on top of it. After seeing what was there, and this was a man whose heart was given to Rome, he had to do penance, he would walk up and down steps, cement steps on his knees. Not something to walk up them, but do you ever try to walk down cement steps on your knees? Uh, he would uh, fast, he would afflict himself, but he realized all of this was error. One day he walked in a church where they had a Bible which was chained onto a podium and he opened to a verse that said, the just shall live by faith. He said this means that all these whippings I've been given myself and all this punishment doesn't accomplish anything that were saved by the grace of God. He turned to another place where it said, By grace are ye saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not that of works, lest any man should boast. Now this was taking place in the early 1500s. 
when Martin Luther stood up and he said, uh, he stood up before his, you know, he had a congregation because he was a priest. He started preaching justification by faith. You don't need to do all these things to be saved. You don't, he, that's what he began to, these Catholic people have been afflicting themselves and paying money to get loved ones out of purgatory. Luther started preaching straight from the Bible. Then he realized there was something wrong with the Bible. He had the Latin Vulgate. So what he did, he forsook the Latin Vulgate and he retranslated the Bible from the Textus Receptus, the received text of Antioch, and produced what is called the Luther Bible, which is exactly the same as the King James, but it's in the German language. I have a copy. It's very amazing. So um, Martin Luther then became under the came under attack by Rome. He was looked at as a rebellious, dissident priest. And of course they filed charges against him. He responded by writing out a list of 95 things that were wrong with the Catholic Church, called the 95 Theses. He went over to the church at Wittenberg, or in Germany they'd pronounce it Wittenberg, and he nailed these 95 theses onto the big wood door of the church. One of them said that the Pope was not holy and that he couldn't get anybody to heaven if he pledged his own soul for security. So he really attacked the system. Then he was called to a trial. They hauled him in because he was still a priest. And they said in order for him to remain a priest, he would have to recant and take back everything he said about Rome. That's when he made his famous speech, which started out, Hier stehe ich, ich kann nicht anders tun. He picked up the Bible, and that was unheard of at that time. Very few people had them. But he picked one up and said, Hier stehe ich, here I stand. Ich kann nicht anders tun, I can do nothing else that if you're going to prove me wrong, you'll have to do it by this book. And he walked out. They tried to kill him a number of times, but he was protected by a man named Georg, a prince, Georg the Junker, as they called him, or Junker Georg. And uh, he was protected by him, and of course he translated his Bible during that time of protection. He claims that Satan appeared to him while he was translating the Bible because he translated it into German so everybody could read it. And he said he actually had a visible, literal confrontation with the devil. Martin Luther began to discover a lot of truth. In fact, one of the statements he made was this. He said, if you are searching for God, begin your search with Jesus Christ and end it there. Now, if you think about that, that's an amazing statement. So, he started, he broke away. He had his one congregation there. Other congregations began to pick up on this because they could hear and see the joy that was in the people that they weren't bound by this awful yoke of Rome anymore. That there wasn't a purgatory. That they didn't have to do all these awful things. Now, Martin Luther did keep a lot of the Roman Catholic stuff in the church as far as their traditions, their rituals, and so forth. But still, the difference was so great that a lot of people wanted to follow him. And as following, following Luther, they had to call themselves something. They called themselves Lutherans. That we are like Luther. We believe what Luther believes. We are Lutherans. Now, the Lutherans of today aren't anything like what Martin Luther taught. They're drastically different. I know I used to be one. Okay. So a Reformation began to break out. Now, I'm going to digress back to the Renaissance. I'm not going to have time to do that tonight. But that started in Italy in about 1300. I jumped ahead to the Reformation for a reason, however. And that won't become apparent until next time. I think what we'll do next time is I'll tell you a little bit more about the Reformation because other reformers came forth, such as Calvin, who started... Uh, a reformed church. 
Swingley, Knox, Wycliffe. In fact, there was a reformer back in the late 1400s by the name of John Huss. Johann Huss, John Huss we'd call him. He was actually burned at the stake. And, you know, for his faith, the Catholic people took him, tied him to a stake, put fire on him, burned him to death. But he told his followers that he had been teaching his Bible class. He said, if I cross my hands like this, it means I feel no pain. While the flames were leaping up around him, he crossed his hands. Then he prophesied. He said, today you cook this goose. But in 100 years, a gander will rise up that you will not be able to stop. Strange words. But what's unusual about it is the word Luther means gander in German. And the Catholic system could not stop the Reformation that ensued. So it's kind of interesting. Now, uh, what we'll do then next time the Reformation began to get greater and greater. In fact, we're going to start talking about Henry Henry VIII, I think, would be a good place to start next time, the Church of England. And then we'll go back and look at the Renaissance a little bit, and then I'm going to show you about the rise of the secret societies, the formation of the nations of Europe, and the formation of a new secret order designed to put together, finally, a one-world government called the Illuminati. So we'll... Uh, stop here because time is, well, we have one minute. Are there any questions or comments? Okay. Yeah, I'm glad you reminded me. I needed to bring that out. Martin Luther nailed the 95 Theses to the church door at Wittenberg on October 31st, Halloween, which in the Lutheran church is a holiday called Reformation Day. We always thought it was neat in school as kids that Reformation Day was on Halloween. We thought that was just great. <laughs> okay. Shall we? No, not really. No, Halloween was a later development uh, during these Middle Ages. It was actually, it was uh, yes and no. Not like today. Um, there were... Uh, it wasn't so much sanctioned, okay? But it was kept as an ancient tradition. And it was it found its way into the church, but it wasn't that the church really sanctioned it. Now, as time went on, I'll try to get the exact date for you. They did declare it uh, All Hallows' Eve. In fact, by the uh, 1300s, they were already celebrating it, I believe, as All Hallows' Eve, so the church by that time must have sanctioned it. I'll try and get a date for you. Were you referring to when Luther did it? Were they celebrating it then? Yeah. Yeah, they were. All Hallows' Eve. Yeah. When or what? How do you, what do you mean? Why did he do it? To make a statement. He wanted to say to them, this is what I believe and this is where you're wrong. He wanted to tell them that they were wrong and they needed to correct these things. Okay. Time is up. So why don't we uh, close with prayer and then we can go. Father in heaven, again we thank thee that we could be here tonight to study these things and I pray that thou wouldst help us to not be forgetful but always to remember and to give thee the glory for all that thou hast done in preserving thy word and thy people. Be with us now, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen.